presenter uh, wrote a pretty infamous blog post uh, a couple months ago called Why Bother with Social Media? So we knew we had to talk to this guy about, uh, about his thoughts. Uh, Andrew Tiemann is the co-founder of Heart, which is a modern uh, creative agency here in Boston. Mm -hmm. He's had 15 years experience in web-based marketing uh, with uh, executive roles in digital media and social marketing with the Boston Beer Company and Hill Holiday. And he's going to offer a simple marketing framework designed for uh, brewers of all scaling size to prioritize communication channels. And he's also going to discuss how craft brewers would be better served utilizing social media as an execution channel as opposed to a primary communication strategy. So without further ado, Andrew Tiemann. Infamous, huh? <laughs> Is there a little, uh... yes. there we go. Hello. Hello, yeah. So I, I don't know how infamous the blog post was, but you know, it was enough to get me here today. And yeah, I think the irony was um, most of my last several years was spent as a, a guy who made a lot of money from uh, peddling social media as a solution to all of the, the world's problems. And you know, recently I've thought a lot about um, you know, whether there's actually anything behind social media when it comes to building brands, and <clears throat> we'll talk a bit about that uh, today. So, yes, hello, uh, my name is Andrew uh, Tiemann. I run a creative shop around the corner here in Boston called Heart. Uh, some snaps for what we do, from what we do over there. Um, <clears throat> you know, I want to talk, as Ray mentioned, uh, a bit about how to think about marketing, how to think about creative, uh, how to think about brand as a means to helping your, um, you know, your breweries and your brands break through. Um, I know Mark uh, from Narragansett talked about a bunch of stuff uh, this morning, and, and I think we're going to touch on some similar areas, uh, though we've got some probably divergent thoughts on, on some of it. So um, just as a bit of a level set, and I know everybody in here is acutely aware of this, but you know, this is what the average beer drinker is facing when they walk into a retail establishment right now. Um, and you know, this is not, uh, this is the norm, at least from what I've seen. The, the sheer amount of choice uh, that drinkers face is just overwhelming. Um, so the idea um, you know, that you're just going to make a beer and throw it on the shelf and everything comes up roses after that is, is uh, a fantasy, frankly, um, because it's just hundreds and hundreds uh, of beers on each shelf um, in each establishment. Um, and to that point, you know, this is a, a picture I snapped around the corner here a couple weeks ago um, at a liquor store near my house. Um, and the shelf in that liquor store looks not unlike what I just showed you. Um, and these beers, I, I didn't do this for effect. This is top left uh, eye level on the shelf. Uh, this is a major brewery. Um, there's dust on the bottles. Um, that's my fingerprint from scra scraping the dust off of here. So, you know, needless to say, um, <clears throat> if you if you plan to break through, uh, you got a lot of work here because uh, this is what what the world's starting to look like. Um, and when I ask. Uh, small breweries in particular, and I talk to a lot of them, um, how you plan to get off the ground, right? You've made your beer and, and everything's going, going well. Um, almost invariably, I hear this. Uh, I'm gonna do social media. Um, and it sort of stops there. And you know, I get it. You know, the perception is social media is free. It's easy. You can do it without any outside help. Uh, beer is inherently social, so we'll just do social media, right? And everything will be, it'll be great. Um, <clears throat> you know, what I think is missing here is that social media uh, is not in and of itself a strategy, uh, but rather it is a tactic, it's a channel through which you tell your story. Uh, and other channels, just to put it in perspective, your advertising, your PR, your product, which we'll talk about a little bit, packaging, we'll talk a lot about that, it's really important, content events, all these different ways that you can communicate with your drinkers, social media is but one part of that larger story. Um, so what we'll talk about today is a little bit uh, of a framework, I'm a strategist, so I think in frameworks, um, of how you can sort of organize and prioritize these things uh, in the name of growth. So I wanted to break the, break the world down into four parts. Um, again, keep it as easy as possible. Um, and these are all things, in my opinion, that whether you're Miller Coors or you two guys in a garage you can do today. Um, I wanted to keep it simple, I wanted to keep it applicable to everybody. Um, and if we think about the world in these four steps, um, I think there's a lot of gain to be made. Um, but it's really about organizing from the get-go and making sure you're positioned uh, for growth. And we'll talk about each of these um, in a little more depth. <clears throat> so first, make a great product. Um, <clears throat> you know, we're going to move quickly through this. Um, this is my friend Todd uh, Bellamy. Todd's been in the industry for a while. Some of you guys may know him. 
Uh, he was a customer service guy over at Sam Adams when I was there, uh, one of the nicest guys I've ever met. His true passion, though, has always been making sake. It's all he talked about, made sake in his garage. Um, <clears throat> and he's since left Sam Adams to start his own sake brewery, and he only cares about making the best possible sake he can. If you talk to him about brand or bottling or all the other stuff, his eyes glaze over, he doesn't care, he wants to make great sake. Um, and that's where it all begins, making a fantastic product. And again, I trust just that, you know, by mere virtue of your presence here, you've got this knocked, so I'm not going to spend time on, on the product piece. I can't help you there anyhow. Um, so have a great story. And again, Mark uh, talked a bit about this this morning and, and you know, said a lot of stuff uh, that I completely agree with. Um, the way I think about story um, is sort of the answer to this question. So if I grabbed any one of you in the audience today, um, and I'll pick on Maggie in Backlash here, and I said, well, what, you know, what's Backlash? Tell me what Backlash is. And this is how, by the way, I start every conversation with every potential client I ever meet with. Um, big and small, <laughs> tell me what your brand is. Uh, and almost invariably, it's met with uh, a little silence, a little stumbling, uh, and then a really long monologue that kind of goes nowhere. <laughs> it's a little all over the place. Um, you know, but but this, is, this is critical. You know, getting this knocked um, is extremely important. Uh, do you have an answer to this that is clear, that is differentiated, that is unique, and above all, is interesting? Um, and you know, we saw this morning in some of the Brewery Challenge um, presentations, I, I think a lot of you guys, if you're still in the audience, did a great job with this. There were stories that began every piece. Um, I will say, uh, and this, this happens uh, more often than not, people tend to get in this space very quickly into quality ingredients and small and you know, these creation stories that frankly uh, may feel unique to you, but are now really just cost of entry into the category is what everybody is saying. Quality ingredients, small, craft, community, um, all these types of things, scarcity, um, little guy, you know, these are not interesting stories. These are not going to give you something that you can hook onto and, and grow from, I can promise you that. Um, <clears throat> you know, and the reason the story matters, and again, we're called Heart, you know, my shop's called Heart for a reason. Um, we have a really strong belief that in almost every instance, whether you're beer or cars or insurance, and I've worked on all of them, um, it's really about connecting the heart, that story that you have with the heart of the drinker. Um, because that's where you really begin to get that emotional connection with your audience. And it's through that emotional connection, through that heart, uh, that you ultimately get to the wallet. Um, it's what makes people want to uh, <coughs> invest in your brand, invest in your product, be part of what you're doing. It's connecting your heart with that drinker, uh, that drinker's heart. And that is story. That is uh, where it all begins. And you know, to be honest, we could spend the better part of a day just doing story <laughs> and brand positioning. Uh, and this could be a day long talk in and of itself. Um, but to give you really quick high-level examples of what story starts to look like, I want to run through just a couple quick things here. Um, first is Tom's, and you know, I think everybody here is probably familiar with Tom's, one for one. Um, you know, and this is, this is pulled right off of the website. My partner at heart used to work on this brand a while back. Um, you know, Tom's in business to help improve lives. We identify a global need. We create products to help address them. Um, so whether that's footwear or eyewear or coffee, uh, their mission, their story is social entrepreneurship and everything comes out of that. Blake who runs this company bleeds this. Their products uh, pay it off, their story pays it off. Everything they do is born out of this story and it's simple. And if you ask him, what is Tom's? He's gonna repeat this to you verbatim a hundred times if asked a hundred times. Um, it's super clear, it's super succinct, succinct and it gives them something from which everything else can build. Uh, I want to pull an industry example here, clown shoes. Um, I was having a conversation a while back um, with some other brewers and they were shitting on this brand and they hated it and they just thought the names were misogynistic and it was terrible. Um, you know, but I actually feel a little bit differently. Maybe not the brewery that I would start or the brand that I would start uh, or build, um, but I love what they have created. Uh, it's divisive um, and, it, and, and they've got this, this is, I pulled this right off of their website, um, beer without pretension. You know, being free and a little crazy, and I think this comes through beautifully in the, in the products that they put out. Uh, the names, you know, it's unapologetic. It forces a decision. Um, this guides who they are, and again, love them or hate them, and I'm guessing it's love or hate. People probably don't feel too indifferently about this brand. Um, that, to me, is story. That's strong. Uh, that gives them that guiding principle. You know, again, Maggie in, in Backlash, I think, is another great example. Backlash, to me, has a very strong position. Um, <clears throat> there's a, another agency that talks about don't just uh, have a positioning, take a position. And I think this is a really great example of that. Um, so again, you know, all these things line up um, 
as, as different components of that story, these become channels through which you can, you can tell that story, um, whether it's product, whether it's uh, social media, whether it's content, whether it's advertising. We're gonna get into each of these um, a little bit, not all of them, obviously. Um, you know, but that story, once it's defined, makes all this stuff really easy. Uh, I can tell you I've been doing this a long time. Uh, to jump right into social media, to jump right into PR, uh, packaging, all this stuff, if you do not have that story above it, all those things are really difficult. And you're going to do them three, four, five times because you're going to screw them up. Um, having that story above all of this makes these things very, very easy. But don't mistake the bottom part for the top part. Uh, that is the input. These are the outputs. And I think I see a lot of people, uh, not just in this industry in general, that start with these. Uh, and, it, and it tangles them up. And it, it certainly doesn't serve them well. <clears throat> so telling it well, um, yeah, of course, a great story poorly told isn't a very great story at all. Um, <clears throat> there's all these channels. Uh, fine, we've got our story. Um, how do we really tell it well through these channels? How do we tell it with impact? Uh, and I want to talk about some of the ways this can start to come to life in ways that, uh, again, drive growth. So Dogfish um, is a brand I've always loved. Um, you know, they've got a pretty eclectic portfolio. Um, but one thing I think they do really well is they tell product stories beautifully. Um, not every single thing maps to their brand beautifully. Um, but I think these two are, are great examples. Again, pulled right from their words, not mine. Uh, we're inspired by music, right? Miles Davis, Bitches Brew, um, <coughs> beer. We like to keep it a little kooky. This is, uh, pronouncing it right, I hope, chicha. You know, where you chew the corn, you spit it out. It's a little gross. But it certainly pays off that idea of keeping it kooky, right? These are their brand promises. And these are their products paying them off. They are telling these product stories. Uh, excuse me, telling these brand stories through these products. They map really nicely. And uh, you know, it dawned on me again this morning, uh, lots of uh, folks pitching uh, their brewery ideas or their beer ideas. The question I kept hearing was, well, why did you start with XYZ style? And there were some good answers, but there were a lot of answers that were you know, a little rambling. I think you're really being thoughtful about how your brand plays through in your product is a really important uh, <coughs> decisioning mechanism for how you choose the styles that you put out. One says a lot about the other. Uh, package design, <coughs> uh, this is a huge, huge, and I'm, again, I'm, I'm from a creative shop, so obviously this is something that I love and care a lot about. Um, I understand, by the way, the things I'm showing you up here are exceptionally beautiful and likely exceptionally expensive to produce, so uh, I'm, I'm aware of that. Um, you know, but design to me is a critical component that I see so many small breweries overlook. We'll get to it later. I'll make it in Photoshop. My friend can do it. Um, and, and it's a huge mistake. You invest in design early on. It's extremely important. Going back to that early photo, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of plain brown bottles. Um, easy way to leap off the shelf is to start looking really different. And we're seeing some uh, breweries do this. Newburyport, for instance, one of my favorite beers. The packaging is stunning. It's beautiful. The um, reason I grabbed that for the first time was the packaging. I don't get to the liquid unless I grab the packaging. So tell me all you want about your ingredients and how wonderful the beer is. Don't care because I'm not getting to it because I don't see it. Um, and trust me, designers want to work with beer companies. I had a conversation this morning um, with another agency in town, and I told her I was here, and she said, oh, damn, can you, can you get me some connections? I want to work with a beer company. Um, and that's not to say you should exploit designers, but you should know that they want to work on this stuff. You can get people to do spec work. You can get cheap stuff. This is a category that designers want to be part of. Uh, take advantage of that. This is a huge, huge part uh, of what's going to make your brand grow. <coughs> A little out of category thing, but I, but I love this one. This is Method. Um, I don't know if anybody here has Method uh, in their home. Uh, we do. My wife loves it. You know, what, <clears throat> what's great about Method is Eric, one of the founders, um, talks about how he wanted to make a cleaning product that people, didn't want, that people would not hide under their sink. He wanted to make a cleaning product that would sit in the counter. Um, and if you think about that, um, it's one of those brilliant little things that seems so obvious now, but at the time is revolutionary. And now you look, go to Target and you look at the cleaning section and it all looks like this, right? This has now become the category norm. Uh, so I see things like Newburyport Brewing um, and I see some of these other uh, brands that I just showed. <coughs> I do think there's gonna be a tip um, where this becomes the category norm for, for beer, but there's still time, I think, to get in front of that. And even if you stick with the brown bottles, uh, make those labels jump, it's gonna make a huge difference. You're gonna get pulled off the shelf uh, faster. Uh, Procter & Gamble has something they call the first moment of truth. It's where user stands, or consumer stands in front of a shelf, and they decide in those first couple of seconds whether they're buying a Procter & Gamble product or something else. Driven almost entirely by design and advertising, obviously, beforehand. But that moment, people eat with their eyes first. Design matters. 
as you think about design, um, you know, one of the other thing, things I think is extremely important is to think in systems. Um, this is Pastine. Um, if I had just said Pastine, I don't know how many people would have known what I was talking about. If I show the yellow uh, food labels that are in the grocery store, it's a Northeast thing, maybe it's not uh, other places. But this is this billboard that I see in every Shaw's and Stop and Shop and Wegmans that I ever go to. Um, and what's beautiful about this is if you don't know Pastine, that's fine, but you know the visual system, which makes it very, very easy for Pastine to introduce new components to their line and to trade people around. Because I already buy the vinegar peppers, so when they bring in the garlic peppers, I just, I'm already in the Pastine section, I trust, I move along. So as you introduce new styles, these design uh, systems become extremely important. To that point, design systems does not mean boring. Some of you might look at this and say, well, that's really dull. You just said beautiful design, and this is a bunch of yellow shit. Um, I, you know, I look at things like pretty things, um, and pretty things, you know, every label is a work of art. Beautiful, intricate, special design. But when you line them all together, uh, they're creating a system. There's a very distinctive pretty things look. Um, so you do not have to trade one against the other. Systems does not mean boring, but think in terms of systems so you have elasticity as you grow. Uh, set everything up as if you're going to be a $500 million brewery, not a $5 million brewery. You'll, you'll, you'll be happy you did uh, when you get to that level. Um, I want to come back to social media and content for a second because um, <clears throat> despite, I guess, why I'm here to begin with, I don't hate social media. I think it's got its place. Um, when I was at Sam Adams, I was their first uh, and only digital guy. <clears throat> Here's some content I created. Um, and why I wanted to show these three things, I think you know, what we've got to remember when we do sit down uh, in front of our computers or pick up our phones is we in the beer industry are living a life that most people don't live. Uh, you in the beer industry, I'm not in it anymore, I guess. Uh, most people wear ties and sit at desks and shuffle around TPS reports, we're making beer. Um, <clears throat> and this is really cool, right? So this was, when I was at Sam Adams, my mandate, as it were, was to just walk around finding interesting things. And, yeah, so whether it was hand bottling some of the barrel room stuff at the brewery, um, the tasting room in the office, people went bananas when I showed them that, right? They're in their accounting office and we've got a tasting room. Um, or this photo on the right, which has become a little bit of a, an iconic photo from Sam Adams now, this was on Jim's Blackberry. I was sitting in his office and he was shuffling through his Blackberry. I said, give me that photo. <laughs> um, that was meant for his kids when he was at Hop Selection, but you know, everything down to the denim shirt peeking out uh, tells a beautiful story. No caption needed on that one, right? Um, so these are the ways I think you begin to communicate through these channels. Um, again, all these things together map to something larger and much more powerful. Um, you know, lastly, we talked about investing in design. You know, one of the other things I think that's really um, overlooked too often is PR. Um, I've grown to love over the last several years um, the power of PR. Uh, so whether it's GQ or Men's Fitness or Women's Health, I just grabbed a bunch of screenshots here. There's hundreds of magazines. Get out of the beer geek industry get into the mainstream for this sort of stuff, it matters. Um, are you gonna sell a billion more cases because you're in men's fitness? No, um, but uh, these magazines have huge reach and beyond that they have a badging and a validation quality to them. Um, meaning, uh, yeah, Ray told me about uh, the brewery, but then I saw it in GQ and now GQ frankly has more weight than Ray does, so I'm gonna buy it because I trust GQ. Um, you know, my sister-in-law runs a, a day spa on the North Shore, and she covets that Best of Boston, Boston Magazine Award every year. Um, yeah, she's proud of winning, but it's about putting that badge on her door. Validation from Boston Magazine. It means a lot. Do not underestimate the power of this. PR is very, very, uh, <coughs> very, very strong in that regard. Um, but regardless of what channel you choose or how you sort of tell these stories, um, there's this quote that comes from Dan Wyden, famous advertising guy, <laughs> talks about being a great storyteller and says, none of this matters, just move me dude, just make something that's interesting, whether it's design, whether it's PR, whether it's social media, um, just move me, make something interesting. Um, people are emotional beings, uh, rationalizing about the liquid inside and the ingredients you use, supporting fact, speak to the emotion, this is how people buy, it's how they think, it's how they react uh, to this stuff. Uh, lastly, I want to talk a bit about giving it a boost. So you, you get this story uh, set, you, you beautiful design, PR, all that sort of thing. Uh, I want to talk a bit about marketing, marketing with a capital M, um, paid media, as it were. Um, you know, and starting by going back to this idea of I'm going to do social media, and uh, you know, I'm, this is where I'll rain on the parade a little bit, uh, a little bit more. Um, I don't know if anybody in here is a South Park fan, um, but one of my favorite South Park episodes ever, um, 
is one with the underpants gnomes, where uh, as the plot goes, the gnomes steal the underpants as step one, and then step three, they profit. And you know, this to me is, I think, how a lot of people approach social media, which is we're going to do social media, and then we profit. <laughs> um, and I think it's a bit of a fool's errand because uh, social media, uh, on the whole, and Facebook in particular, are paid mediums. They are not free. Uh, engagement is a fantasy. Uh, nobody wants to talk to your brand, uh, and Facebook is doing a very good job of keeping you from being able to talk to even the people who are your fans. Um, they so far, uh, as recently as March, have come out themselves and said, it's a paid medium, it's always been a paid medium. Um, trust me, I've been in the ad agency world. Uh, while the consumer side is talking to you about you know, changing the world of communication, uh, every day I would get briefed from a Facebook rep telling me about a new crevice they found to cram an ad into. <laughs> I mean, this is what it's all about. Um, and you know, the stats bear it out. This is also really recent uh, data. Um, you know, if you, I'll spare you uh, all reading all the fine print. <clears throat> what this is saying is um, you are only reaching 6% of your own fans. Um, meaning, if you've got 1,000 fans on your Facebook page, when you post a piece of content, no matter how good it is, 60 of them will see it. And by see it, I mean it will show up in their news feed. They still may not see it. They still may not care about it. It still may have zero impact. So mathematically, uh, it's, it's a race to the bottom here. Um, <clears throat> there is no such thing as free marketing, social media included. Uh, I would say social media especially at this point. The data does not lie here. The good news is, uh, if you do want to pay for marketing on Facebook, the targeting is brilliant. So this is a little cut I ran the other night, uh, just to sort of see what was going on out there. Um, if you were a brewer that makes a stout uh, and you distribute in New England, uh, here's a little uh, cut. This is a, in Facebook's ad tool of drinking age in New England, interest in stout, upcoming birthday, 3,000 people. So you can, if you'd like, for about 30 to 70 cents a click, um, reach these people and tell them, hey, why don't you have one of our stats on your birthday, which is coming up next week. Uh, creepy, maybe, accurate, absolutely. <laughs> um, so if you're going to pay, you can certainly reach these people. Um, but it's, a pay, for, it's a, pay, uh, a pay platform. Getting way away from social media for a second here, um, this is a billboard that <clears throat> was actually the first thing that we did when, when we started our shop. And you know, having been a digital guy for almost 15 years now, the last thing I thought I'd do would, would be a billboard. Um, and the reason I wanted to show this is I think you know, if you don't know the mechanics of the media, the costs of the media, uh, frankly, just how advertising works, it's a complicated, silly business. Um, you may look at this and say, why the hell would I ever buy a billboard? I think Mark said earlier, you can't compete with AB and, and those guys. And he's right, you can't. Uh, however, uh, I believe, if I'm, I'm remembering correctly, design not included here, and model photography, all that sort of stuff, the media for this billboard was around $20,000. Uh, it ran, if you're familiar with the area, on the Mass Turnpike uh, eastbound, both directions on Route 93, in Back Bay, all over the T. Um, and it ran for about three months, $20,000 thereabouts. But remnant media on this one. Uh, outpaced anything we did in terms of digital buy for them, or digital anything, social media included. Um, this was almost a year ago. We still get people talking about this billboard. Um, don't count out old school media. <laughs> this stuff works. It's around for a reason. These billboards are everywhere and they're always full of ads because they work. Um, I never thought I'd be standing up on a stage saying that, again, as a digital guy. Um, but we've got more mileage out of billboards than I ever thought we would. And certainly more mileage for our dollar than we have out of social media. Um, if you think billboards are crazy, um, I'm going to show you TV. <laughs> Uh, you know, I was actually just reading an ad age last week. It looked like Kona and I want to say New Belgium experimenting with TV. Um, what we've got here on the bottom right, Sam Adams, obviously. You know, Jim Cook and Sam Adams have done a lot of great things over the years. They still do. Uh, I would argue one of the smartest things they ever did was invest heavy in TV early on. Um, you know, they've reached a point now where they can spend $20, 30000000 million a year. Wasn't always the case. They had to start somewhere. Um, you can spot buy TV. Uh, you can produce a TV ad. You can get something running in a local market a hell of a lot cheaper than you think. Uh, I was actually watching something earlier this morning. Bentley, the automotive uh, company, just shot an ad on iPhones. Looks beautiful. Um, yeah, they're Bentley. But you know, the point is, they shot a beautiful ad on iPhones. Uh, I've worked on stuff at my old agency where we shot beautiful video for $10,000 and under. Production, everything. Uh, can traffic these for a lot cheaper than you think. 
And the beautiful thing about TV is you are going to reach people outside of the category, and that is critical to your growth. Uh, you're not talking to people in here. TV is going to allow you to expand your base in a large way. Uh, Dollar Shave Club up on the top here. Some of you guys might have seen this online. Uh, same thing. This is a startup, a digital company selling razors online. Uh, you talk to these guys. They say, what's the thing that grew you? Yeah, it was a viral video. They really exploded when they bought TV straight away, unapologetically. Not a digital thing anymore. It's a TV thing. Um, you know, again, as a digital guy, this is hard for me to say, but TV, man, if I had a dollar, uh, this is where I'd start, to be honest. Or a lot of dollars, I understand. One dollar's not going to get you TV. Um, so just to sort of recap um, these four things, again, I think you know, have a great product. Yeah, that's, that's you guys. Uh, have a great story. This is the imperative. If there's one thing that uh, I, I just need to leave you with, uh, walk out of here and make sure you've got a good answer to that question. <laughs> if you're asked, can you answer it succinctly? Is it interesting? Is it differentiated? Is it ownable? Um, give the lovely folks at Craft Beer Cellar something that they can say to your customers on your behalf. That's nice and succinct. Uh, tell it well. You know, use these channels wisely. Invest in design. Invest in PR. Um, create things that are going to have impact. Think in systems. Think like a big company. You can act like a small one. Think like a big one. Um, it'll pay dividends later. And give it a boost. Don't be afraid of paid media. Um, there is no such thing as free marketing. I, I hate to say it, it, social media included, social media especially, marketing is not free. Um, and, and one last thing, actually, I want to leave you with. Yeah, this is a, probably the most rudimentary timeline I could possibly come up with, uh, and it has so many terrible assumptions in it. But what I'm trying to demonstrate here is if you have to think about when to engage these things, so okay, fine, I've got to get a creative partner and a PR partner, and it sounds like a lot of work. Here's roughly how I think about it. Um, and I understand, again, some of the stuff overlaps. Uh, it looks like it's blocked out. That's supposed to say sales on the green uh, block there. Uh, engage a creative company early on. Um, or creatives, not even a company, it can be a person. Uh, get that positioning right, get that naming right. Um, heard earlier about quirky names and those sorts of things. Whatever the names are, uh, work with a great creative partner early to help you get that sorted out. Identity and packaging, do that early, uh, do it well. It's gonna be much harder if you do it down the line, I promise you. You're gonna have stuff out there with one label, you're gonna be trying to back in another one, get it right the first time. Social is great for building base early on. PR. Get that in front of your sales and distribution when you're about to really hit the streets and the shelves. Engage PR, great time for it. Um, and once you're sort of on the shelves there, think about that advertising. You know, if you've worked in the CPG category, um, you know, so much of advertising is frankly in support of the retail establishments and the wholesalers, you know, showing them that you're supporting the program. Uh, so yeah, advertising is going to drive consumers. That's also going to show the retailers, the wholesalers, and all those channels um, that you're supporting uh, the product as well. Um, so sorry I talked a bit fast <laughs> today. I got a lot of stuff to back in here. Um, you know, that's me, Twitter, email. Please reach out. I love talking to people about this stuff after, after the fact. Um, I'll answer all the emails I can, I promise. I'm a little slow sometimes with it. But um, please do reach out. And, and thanks again so much to Ray and everybody for, for having me today. That was outstanding. Thanks so much. We have time for uh, one quick question. Um, no. All right. <laughs> um, you brought up a really interesting point earlier about don't just have positioning, take a position. Yeah. Can you expound on that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think, you know, in, in really simple terms, and, and, I, and I'm not trying to sort of slag on, on, on the beer space, but I think it's particularly endemic to the beer space where everybody that I talk to immediately defaults to the same handful of things. Um, again, it's quality ingredients, it's small, it's local, it's quirky. Um, I think that there's a lot more room there to stand for something. I think if you're trying to create an emotional connection um, and you want to stand out, uh, there's a need to stand for something that's clearly differentiated, that frankly forces a decision. You know, I think a lot of the brands I've worked with over the years, uh, the default is we want to be for everybody. Um, and again, I know I'm bringing up Maggie a bunch here, but you know, she mentioned something with Backlash that like, they, they, they were okay at times not being for everybody. And I think that's a really powerful thing to be. Um, you know, really focusing in on a particular segment of people and being okay not being for everybody else um, is extremely powerful. Um, you know, we, we joke in the ad world, uh, there's an idea that you can test your way right to the middle. And I think that's the worst place to be. Outstanding. Well, I know you fought through this. Andrew's fighting a little bit of a cold right now, but that Sorry. was really, really great. Really Thank appreciate you, you doing Thank that. You. Thanks so much for coming out. Thanks so much.